vibrant South African style, both of the designers gathered for a spectacular showcase in 1999. Since uh, Mandela was released, a uh, young generation came into its own here. City of Gold, Johannes is with the host of the now annual South African Fashion Week. South African Fashion Week's second year. It's a wonderful showcase for local um, designers who have never had the, the, the opportunity to, to show to a public ga gallery what they do. I've always believed fashion is international, but wherever you come from, it has an influence of where you live. And to, to come and see that, that same international, the sophistication of, of, of the international market with an African edge, I think it's, it's quite amazing. There is a pulse, they call it like a pulse of Africa, and they call Johannesburg the gateway to Africa. The city is full of uh, interesting contrasts. You get people who've just come out of villages, still in their traditional head wraps. And uh, of course, people flip through magazines. 80s top model Alexis Singer goes behind the camera. Living in South Africa, you kind of live on the edge in a big way. Discover an ancient art of the Tuareg tribe from the Sahara Desert. They are the best silversmiths in Africa. Designer Gavin Raja looks to traditional influences. I think people don't realize you can do ethnic or you can do a South African image and still retain high fashion trend in it. And Errol Renz is in the mood for glamour. All we're doing is in South Africa, we are making women beautiful. We're using the sights and the sound and the, and the images of Africa very well, I think. And I hope the world recognises that soon. I think wearing clothes like this, it makes you feel feminine. And it's everyday wear. The clothes are nice. The clothes are really nice. I have some sexy pieces coming. It's very sort of, uh, you feel like, sort of Meryl Streep, kind of out of Africa-ish, eat your heart out. I do have my farm in Africa after all, even if it's only for five minutes on the rack. <laughs> A favorite among models, Gabby Rosenworth's collection combines feminine clothes with a tailored edge. I felt very strongly for a very feminine range because our look is usually quite tailored and I feel the whole tailoring is going into a very feminine look, so we promoted that. The fabrics are soft and they're dictating at the moment. The sheerness, the florals, the, the chiffons, the georgettes. Lines are simple and it's handwork and beading. That basically was the sort of inspiration, the fabrics. People want glamour at the moment. There's no doubt about it. Women today enjoy being feminine. And I think that's very important, that we don't no longer have to be this sort of power lady. We can be what we are, but look feminine at the same time. Trading is a place full of hidden treasures, from embroidered leather bags to wedding blankets. The art of West African tribes is on display. What we're really interested in doing here is uh, is to show people that um, we have a lot, very rich culture in Africa. Um, the um, the craft that comes out of Africa is of a very very high standard and it's all handmade. It's also very much a whole community process. It's the older women who do the spinning, um, the combing and the spinning of the cotton. It's the men who do the weaving, and it's the women who do the dyeing. Cotton is life to the West Africans. There's no doubt about it. Indigo, the indigenous indigo, comes from the leaves of a tree. And this over here is um, the indigo work that they do with the damask. This cloth here. It will be folded, it's, it's a hell of a process, folded all the way down here, and these two edges are joined together. Do you see that, like that? And then like that, and then they sew it. The fascinating thing about indigo is that it works through a process of oxidization. So it's not how long you leave it in the dye, but the number of times you bring it out of the dye. 
is the most fascinating piece of cloth that I think that we have here. Um, it's called a Tuareg veil. I mean, they really want to impress somebody. Um, they'll probably put three veils on, which would mean 15 meters of um, hand-woven indigo cloth that they'll wrap around their heads and around their faces like this. They call these people the blue men of the Sahara because obviously with this rubbing off onto their skins, it turns them a little bit blue. The other aspect about the hand-woven cotton from West Africa is that um, the cotton is so specific that in fact you could almost go to every single village you would find a different, um, a different design of blanket. So all my creams and my indigos, they come from uh, Burkina Faso, um, Guinea, um, Mali, and it all is um, hand-combed, hand-woven cotton that's then um, got the indigo detail. The textures are absolutely stunning. Inspiring such fashion maestros as Jean-Paul Gaultier, Tuareg tribe silversmiths create one-of-a-kind symbolic jewelry. Tuareg are an ancient tribe from the Sahara Desert. They are the best silversmiths in Africa. The Tuareg um, are animists and they believe in the good eye against the evil eye. So it's all protective symbolism. And the good eye is represented by circles, dots and triangles. This is actually a padlock for a camel bag. And these are the keys, it's got three keys. If you've got a bag that's got big holes in it, you would thread it through here and then close it again. We are trying to show people that we should be embracing our African roots and trying to incorporate the beautiful handmade things from Africa into a contemporary environment and that it can work and that it can be, it can look good, it can be stylish, but still it can have an African identity. Designer Gideon was inspired by everyday people and places around him. Basically my collection is um, about femininity. I used quite a lot of different sort of textures. I love textures. I've done a bit of deconstruction and a sort of dip dyeing and things like that. It's just very soft, very flowing, lots of textures, uh, lots of layering. We do draw, draw, draw a lot of inspiration from, from um, people like Galliano and Gautier and people like that because they are absolutely great. Some of uh, Gideon's work was exciting, the colours and the contrast. He's from Durban and that celebrates, I think, a lot of the colour and exuberance of that city. It's a very big Indian population, so it looked uh, almost like Krishna, some of the styling. The colours that I've gone for is, I've gone for a very nude sort of colours in my evening wear. And I've used like tinges of blue, like sort of going from light onto dark. I've used burgundies and that. Uh, for my trampy sort of range, I used all the bright colours, um, from, like from shock and pink to to bright blue to yellow to sort of everything, leopard print, everything. I've just mixed everything in, in it. I've actually done a whole evening wear sort of on a Renaissance sort of feel, which is quite nice, which, which I like. I try to incorporate a little bit of African influence in it because I think that Africa has got so much to offer and people don't really draw inspiration from that, so that's what I've tried to do. I don't really draw inspiration from Vogue's and things like that, I try and do my own sort of thing. Her tomboy good looks catapulted Alexa Singer into the world of high fashion in the 1980s. Modeling around the globe, she chose to return to her native South Africa to focus on her career behind the camera. The first thing when I went as a model in New York that I bought was a camera. What it gave me as a model is that uh, you know when the lights are good, you know what, what works. So you can translate it into working on the other side. I mean, I love taking pictures yeah, and getting it back and um, seeing your vision realized and, and having people respond to you. With modeling, you just have to pitch up and look good. And um, with this is technical responsibilities. I mean, you know, if, if, you, if you make a mess, you, you're accountable. So getting gray hairs. <laughs> Well, I think the fact that she was a model, a very successful model, that um, she's got um, 
a different perspective. She's been on both sides. She knows um, the modeling side. She knows how to draw that the, the, the personality through the, through the eyes, you know. I think as a photographer it's important to be relaxed with the model because I know when people used to shout at me, um, I'd clam up and you want, you want something to come out of the model. There are very talented people here. They're very talented um, photographers and makeup artists and we've got some good models coming out of South Africa. What I would like to do is incorporate what we have here that's really South African, you know, capturing that culture. She's one of those people that will go out of her way to get the shot and you want someone who's going to go that extra mile to make it special. Coming back here has made me really appreciate um, life. Gavin Raja is a true child of the South African melting pot. His creations mix rural African graphics with intricate Indian embroidery. I think people don't realize you can do ethnic or you can do a South African image and still retain high fashion trend in it. I've tried to use um, a lot of beading, a lot of uh, Zulu beading which has uh, messages in them. Every color combination has a meaning, which is whether it's for friendship, for love, for a woman that's married, an unmarried woman. And I think that's been quite important for me to use those kind of elements and translate them. Um, using lines of architecture in African um, abodes in the rural areas, and I've translated them into garments, uh, all the linear and the geometric shapes. Color comes from India. Um, I think also a lot of the beading comes from India. I've used a lot of embroidery, a lot of raised embroidery, but also not traditional zari embroidery, which is done in gold. So I've just used a technique that's brought over from India, but I've used it to create something African. So the epitome of a of a new of a woman in South Africa at the moment is actually gaining ground and being assertive, but not discarding their femininity. Is collage of feminine and glamorous divas brought back the mood of township life. I've used the traditional kind of couture fabrics, the Chantilly lace, the silk chiffon, but I've also used a lot of high-tech, innovative fabrics. My clientele is a predominantly women who are actually very assertive. They they they're, they're quite confident and they want to actually exude some kind of personality or some kind of individual trait. South Africa is known as the land of diamonds and gold and the Foreman family jewelers have been taking full advantage of these natural resources for decades. Founder Sid Foreman uses his artistic ability to paint and sculpt as well as make one-of-a-kind masterpieces. My father said to me, son, I think you should become a jeweler. And I said, okay. I've been in the trade now 47 years. And the boys, it's really been an ambition of theirs ever since they were little school children to ultimately come into it. We are a team that complement each other. We, we have a common goal. We work in, in that direction, you know. We have the traditional method of manufacturing as well as the, the casting method. The casting method is predominantly a, a more of a mass production approach and the traditional method you would use to make the master. So here we would fabricate the piece from start to finish, melting down the metal, rolling it down and creating the form. This is a platinum and baguette bangle. This will go into our store. This has taken a few months. So we'd select baguettes from this tray, let's say, for that bangle and fit them as, as is needed. Most of our designs, or predominantly the, 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 the designs, are with diamond content. This is local. Um, nine carat jewelry and 18 carat jewelry. Um, which is also uh, colonial because the UK and Australia work in the same heritage, whereas um, in the States it's 14 and 18. 
we have a, a lovely art studio where we do the bronzes. This um, is the finished master. So from here we would take a mold off this to make reproductions. And this would be the finished product. We've achieved these three Diamond International Awards, and uh, which has elevated us to the, uh, to the peak in, in South African uh, jewellery. David, in his first year of apprenticeship, entered. We've been entering for years, and we would never really come anywhere. And then David, the first year, outright won for that one. And then two years later, Mark, my son, designed that uh, white gold bangle. But Lorraine herself has been honored with the De Beers International Diamond Award for her elaborate diamond ring. It's quite unique in the, the annals in the history of it. Uh, it would be fantastic if ultimately I could also win an award, you know, but uh, we've got to wait and see and keep my fingers crossed. I think that men's fashion is going through a revolution at this point in time. Um, the kind of revolution that ladies' fashion went through like 15 years ago. I think that menswear is like very exciting at the moment because there's so much you can do with it. My signature is very much um, tailored casual wear. We basically cater to the trendy young guys. This is my African signature collection, it's in Kasa. In Kasa is a causa word for good taste. We have a diffuse uh, collection um, called the O collection. Um, and this is sort of a ready-wear couture collection. And then we have a jeans wear collection, which um, what we do sort of trendy jeans wear. Fabrication detail is, is vital in what we do. Most of the fabrics I'm using have, have stretching at this season. Um, I use a lot of sort of rayons with um, uh, mixed with, 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 with microfibers um, and, uh, and lacquered effects and uh, sort of turn and turn effects. You can see that I've used um, uh, like the uh, khaki and, 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 and the blue has been important and, and silver grey um, has been important. Um, white's important. Navy blue has been pretty good. We don't have the, the kind of market you guys have in, in the States or in Europe. We definitely have developed these versions for export. Um, we can produce anything the rest of the world can produce right here. Johannesburg Art Gallery hosted an exhibit of South African fertility dolls, an essential ceremonial element of tribal women. It's the first exhibition of its kind in South Africa of the early fertility figures, which were produced right throughout the country um, by many of the different groupings. And they were normally used uh, by the young women at the time of the initiations of the transition between girlhood to womanhood. They're not a doll uh, in the Western sense of the word, just to be played with. They are metaphorical, powerful objects which are made out of specific materials which were part of the female domain, working with clay, with bead, with cloth, with grass, with reed. These are uh, extraordinarily abstract figures produced by the vendor up in the northern Transvaal area. The shape that is taken uh, is uh, said by the woman to be related to the head of the child. These are a group of very rare Zulu figures. They are made on, uh, on bamboo, which is very unusual. The bamboo is uh, associated with reed, which relates back to the early uh, myths, uh, creation myths coming from this region, where the first humans were supposed to be made from clay, reed and water. The lineup of figures here are from the Tonga. They take on these rudimentary, very powerful forms. For instance, here one sees the very strong phallic quality. 
Daphne and Abele are extraordinarily fashion conscious. Uh, she's very beautifully dressed with a front apron, with a cape, and all the accoutrements associated with ceremonial dress. But the extraordinary thing is to see in recent times how she has been replaced by Barbie. The exhibition is dedicated to the, the unknown woman who made these figures, whose hopes, desires and aspirations are still really lodged within these figures. All we're doing is, in South Africa, we are making women beautiful. We often do things because it's all in the air, fashion's in the air. We do many things and I, we do our own interpretations. And um, I'm extremely blessed and grateful that I do have many European clients and I do have American clients and I do have women of the world whom I have the pleasure of dressing. This season I was in the mood for glamour. I felt for glamour, I wanted to do opulence, and um, there's a resurgence I felt for beading and um, femininity. And I'm extremely motivated and very, very driven and terribly excited about my work this season because it's uh, more directional in terms of glamour, big time and razzmatazz roots. Everyone now wants to show again. We're going back to the 80s, it's glamour, it's, I think fashion, it's the yin and the yang. There is no favourite fabric because I would be bored stiff. One season, at the moment I have a tremendous feeling for silk jersey and I have a fabulous duchess satins I adore. One minute I love antique, the next minute I want to be modern, the next minute I change, I'm a chameleon. After trying out other continents, Errol decided to stay in Africa for good. I've tried Provence, I've tried Paris, I've tried London. I love it here because um, I can still breathe. Here I don't have to be a slave. I want to live, I want to create, I want to have fun. We have a stigma down here that whatever we do down here is not really as good as what happens up there. Utter nonsense. I'm very blessed and very grateful for the talent and to be able to be in Africa to be a prophet of style.